is 11.03 and thank you so much for being here today. We really appreciate taking time out of your day to join us. So again, a few housekeeping rules because I know we have some new teachers on, um, on today. So welcome to Edgewood. Um, a few housekeeping rules. What you'll notice is you are an attendee in the presentation. So what that means is your video and voice won't be shown. Only the people at, on the panelist will be here. Can you? Only the people on the panelist will be here. Um, on, on the bottom of the screen, we will have a chat box and we will have a Q&A. So you new teachers, and this is, this is your first time joining in. If you have any questions regarding what we have discussed, please enter them in the Q&A. And as we go through the presentation, we will try to answer those. I will say that the last town hall that we had, we had over 160 questions. So we are to get the ones we've already answered and they will be sent out today in the afternoon after the um, food drive or food distribution we're having today with the police department and the food bank at um, the athletics stadium before the end of the day today. Um, again, anything that hasn't been answered, we'll answer them. And if we have a chance, we'll go ahead and answer the ones live on here, collect those. So. Thank you again for being here. And now I will hand it over to Dr. Hernandez. Good. All right, am I on? Yes. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. So you're probably wondering why I'm wearing this mask. You know, I, I always try to start my meetings with a little bit of humor if, when possible. Uh, but really, if you look, look in the chat, I told you uh, why I, I selected this mask today. You know what? I, I think we can get over already creating different um, masks that say a little bit about yourself. And so for today, I will tell you that my mask uh, is about La Lucha Libre. So uh, when I was growing up, I used to watch Lucha Libre with my old man every, every Sunday. And so my dad and I faithfully watched Lucha Libre live from Mexico City. After that, we would watch the Cowboys, like good, good, like good Texans, good Americans. Some of you may not care for the Cowboys. I do. Most of my life uh, revolved around watching Lucha Libre. So maybe in future meetings, I will be wearing a different mask. But I think in spite of what may be going on outside of the world, we always have a choice. I think like every morning you wake up, you have two choices. You can get up on the good side of the bed. You can get up on the bad side of the bed. Uh, we all have realities that we face in this world. And so I say that to you because uh, the man that sits in front of you has plenty of scars, just like the rest of us. And it hasn't been an easy life, but it is a very blessed life. And so you always hear me talk about those things. I am very grateful for what I have. Just like I had to be grateful to sit as uh, your superintendent, that is still the job that I love doing. Um, and so without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and, and start our meeting this morning. So um, the first thing I want, our, our intended learning outcome revolves around one, one big item. So Olga, if you'll move us along. We're loading that up for you. All right. So again, this is our town hall. And we're going to be having these every Thursday. I think this is extremely important. I, I am intentional about making time for this meeting and all the prep work that goes into it. So we will continue to have these um, next week. We'll have one on the 6th if you'll keep us going. But the learning outcome for us today is to always keep you informed. You keep going. We're keeping you informed about our district's restart plan, which revolves around our five guiding principles, which are being accurate and timely in our communication, which I hope I've proven to you by now that uh, I, I use my communication platforms and, and platforms like this, or speaking uh, in front of different groups when I was able to, or Google Platicas, or yesterday, maybe some of you saw the Express News editorial. I was very honored to be invited. Uh, Edgewood has not been invited to that er editorial board in over 10 years. And so um, I was very honored to be invited. And so um, our first guiding principle is one that's important. Be accurate and timely in your communication. The second is talking about health and safety guidelines, making sure that we have processes that are not only proactive, but they're also that we have processes that would address any particular situation that may or may not come before us, um, looking at the con continuing to address things like mental health and well-being. And I know you hear me talk a lot about our students because you know they are superbly important to me and our families, but that also goes for us in, as employees. And so today you're gonna hear me talk a little bit about an employee assistance program 
um, that I want to discuss with you based on the responses that you guys sent me from last week's um, town hall meeting. I asked you to email me directly and over 300 of you, the mean number, I think was about 306, 307, I don't remember, it would be actually 307 because I just got an email yesterday from someone at, at Memorial. Um, and so um, a lot of you emailed me. So I have some categories of information that I want to share with you today. Uh, we're going to continue about high quality instruction. That's obviously something that is extremely important. Our assistant superintendent, uh, Mr. Mingus, is going to speak to you about that. And then we're going to talk about educational equity. And I want to talk to you about what are we doing intentionally to continue to honor our stance on being uh, on social justice and making sure that we, each one of us, whether we are teachers, staff, support staff, principals, administrators, whoever we are, that we are taking actions every day to make sure that we are providing equity and access for our students, all of our students. And so we'll keep going. Um, so let's start just like we would in the classroom. So Dr. H, what do we know so far? Based on the town halls we've had and information that you've provided, what do we know thus far? So let's, we'll keep going. Thus far, we know that our board um, here on July 21st approved a change to our calendar. So the same intersessional calendar that we had brought before has, was approved so that we could push back our start date to August 17th. You can keep going. We also know that at this point, we've offered parents three instructional models to choose from, and that we've asked them to fill out a commitment form, which is due July 31st. Now, we may be uh, extending that, but at this point, our date is July 31st. But these are the three models that we have um, explained to you, to different groups, virtual town halls, um, in English and Spanish, to our board. We presented at board meetings, study sessions. There's a lot of communication that has gone out on our three instructional models. We can keep going. So we've also asked, we also talked to our board about the first four week transition. And when I say the transition, it's a transition into the school, into the school year. To be specific, and excuse me real quick, because I need to change my view here. I cannot see everything. Give me one second. There we go. Um, our first transition that I'm specifically speaking about addresses schooling between August 17th, which is our first day with kids, all the way up to September 11th. That's the first four-week transition. And I'm going to speak a little more to it in a few slides from now. But this is other information that we know, that we have a four-week transition period that encompasses the dates of August 17th to September 11th. We'll keep going. We also know that the week of August 10th through the 13th, we're going to be we're going to have professional development. That is the contract day for those of you who are teaching in a few other slots. Um, that we're going to be we're going to be providing quality professional development for you uh, as our teachers, and we're also going to be providing professional development for parents. And we'll be doing that in an asynchronous format. Now, with regards to parents, that doesn't mean we're only going to be doing it that week. We're already doing things to support our parents. But, but as part of the professional development week, we'll be, we'll be having uh, sessions for parents too. And of course, those will continue, as will they for you. But I'm specifically talking about the week of August 10th through the, ter through the 13th. I apologize. Now, if we'll go to the next slide. The other thing that you probably know, and if you don't, I want to clarify that, is that every day I'm monitoring daily the briefing that you probably see out there on, if you watch KSAT or any of the different... Um, uh, channels here in San, in San Antonio, there is a constant update of where we stand as a county, as a city. Uh, you can even type in your zip code and it'll tell you um, what are the metrics associated with positivity rates, recovery rates, all sorts of information that is fact-based and that is, revolves around science. Part of my meetings with, with, with our folks here is because I also want you to understand what's my rationale for my decision-making. Take out the whether we agree or don't agree on everything. My intention is to share with you that I am a pragmatist. I am, a, I am, an, I am an eternal optimist. I'm a pragmatist. I, I really stop and I think and I reflect and I check my thinking. Um, and these are just some of the tools that I use to inform my decisions and the decisions that I bring to you as a member of our family. You'll keep going. So, okay. So I shared with you the what do we know up until now, but let me frame the conversation about, that you, about what we're going to talk about today. So, you know, I try to get a little quirky with my PowerPoint, so I hope you see the little frame there. That, um, 
our framing of the conversation today is around the idea of those three things there. How does the coronavirus and its effects, and its effects, sorry, um, affect Edgewood ISD's response to making sure that we are able to do two things, make decisions based on science and make those decisions that promote safety and health and security of our children, of you as our staff, and our parents and clients who come into our buildings, and also making sure that that does not always uh, interfere with us being able to provide a high quality instruction for our kids, which is important, but I wanna break down what high quality instruction means to me. I've said many times that we're more than a test. We are more than just benchmarks. We are more than just, well, those two things are the ones that are probably the, the ones you, you remember. We also provide support from a, uh, to address mental health issues sometimes, social emotional issues. Today, we have our second food drive in the district over at Veterans Stadium in the afternoon. We also address basic needs of our folks. Those are the things that I consider that support instruction, even though they may not appear in the classroom, they directly affect children's ability to learn. And then the third factor that I have to consider also is the guidance that I get from TEA. Now you, you guys watch TV just like I do. Now, of course, I'm in the middle of a lot of things because as a superintendent, there's a lot of information that gets thrown at me. And we'll move to the next picture. The next picture. So as I mentioned before, when I tell you I get a lot of information thrown at me, that's not a joke. Uh, I, sometimes it feels like I'm drinking out of a fire hydrant. I'm sure everybody here has felt that feeling. And it feels like I'm getting a massive amounts. If you look at the picture on the second, right now we're sitting in front of computers all the time. We're Zooming, we're reading emails. So, you know, our cell phones are going on. Someone's texting us. Sometimes someone's joke in a, a playful mood and they send you something random and you're really busy. That's the world we live in. And even though I say we need to be, we need to learn to pivot, we need to be flexible. There's also times where we're human and it feels like you've got whiplash because you're going like this, like this, like this. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I've experienced that this week. That's where we are. So that's the context also that I have to consider, which is why I spend a lot of time with, the, with these uh, presentations because you've got a lot going on in your mind too. I know you've got family. You're wondering what's going to happen with our, with our district. And we all have various varying levels of stress. Some of us can handle stress better than others. Some of us can't. And so those support systems are important. So that's, that's the context of the information that we're, that we're getting at this point. So here's what happened just in July. And to be specific, let me be specific about dates, July 17th to July 28th. July 17th, Metro Health came out with an uh, uh, order that said that we would be able to close until Labor Day. Obviously, that is our Metro Health, the local city of San Antonio, as you see the symbols there. As of Tuesday, our Attorney General came out with an executive briefing saying that was not lawful, that we, that we were not allowed to, or we were not allowed to follow that, that we were required to go back to TEA guidance that we had received earlier. And that guidance has changed now because of the Attorney General's executive briefing. We'll move on. So the guidance that we originally received on July 17th, that's why I highlighted it there, changed in some instances by July 28th. That has a direct effect on how Edgewood ISD is able to respond in terms of what we do in our classrooms, in terms of funding. And I, and I wanna be very clear, you've always asked me to be transparent and I've committed to be transparent with you. Um, I know there are some things that you may not have full understanding of, and for that, I ask you to be flexible and gracious because I have been, I have done the same in sharing information. So I ask folks not to run with things. If you don't, under, if you don't understand, then wait and ask. That's why I'm having these meetings. But in layman's terms, the change in the attendance and enrollment guidance has a direct effect on how we're going to do business over the next few weeks. I wanna be clear, safety and security is still at the forefront for me. Using facts, health facts or health data is also extremely important for me. And I have a guiding crew, which is my school board, that I'm blessed that um, here's, my, here's my recommendations and we work collectively as a group. If we'll keep going. So here's what it means in layman terms for me based, based on the guidance that just came out. 
I am constantly, again, you may think I'm, I'm being repetitive, but I wanna make sure this stays with you. I am going to continue to use health data. When I say percentage of infection, that's the same as saying positivity rates. I am constantly looking at those positivity rates and the graphic that you saw earlier, which is there again on the bottom right, in making decisions that affect our children first and foremost, our employees and our clients, people that come into our buildings. And I know right now no one's really coming into our buildings, but those are factors that I take into consideration. I advise my board, that's that seven member crew that you see there on the top right. And I bring them all this information because I as the superintendent, um, I'm going to make decisions that are going to be in the best interest of Edgewood ISD. And so can we go to the next slide? Edgewood ISD is, this isn't new to Edgewood ISD. We've taken legal action in the past in our history to address wrongs of the past or things that we don't particularly agree with. My usual take on things is that I don't need jerk react to anything. That's just not my nature. I stop. I have, a, I have something I call a 24, 48 hour rule. I stop, I reflect, and I think about my next steps. But I will tell you right now, um, as, we, as we move forward in the next few weeks, I know TEA right now is pushing towards uh, a complete reopening of school. But in, in, about, in about, I'd say 10 minutes, I'm gonna talk a little more about this. I wanna share with you what I'm recommending that we do and that I'm gonna be asking us to do in the next few weeks with regards to moving towards continuing to educate children, that's the first priority, and addressing some of your requests. Now, obviously, I'm gonna say up front, there is no possible way that I could address every unique situation. I hope you know that. And I hope that if I haven't earned your trust already, you know that whatever decisions I make, I'm making them from a good place because that's just my nature in general and that's how I lead. But while I am addressing the needs of our district, I also have to think about what happens to us in future years if the state threatens to not fund us if we don't follow the guidance the way that they're spelling it out right now and i say right now because i showed you the picture of july 17th now july 28th today's july 30th for all i know tomorrow i get something new and i'm being honest with you but here's what i'm going to tell you i will make decisions through this first four-week transition and then the second four-week transition you're going to hear me talk about that in a few minutes also that are based on again educating children and monitoring health facts that will help me address and work with my board on making decisions that keep our children protected. I do that as a superintendent. I do that as a parent. I do that as a leader also of our district. And if that means that we don't, we're gonna have to challenge the state on a funding issue, well, I think most of you know we've done that before in Edgewood. And so if we have to get into litigation with the state, then I'm prepared to make that recommendation to the board. And I know the high quality people we have on the board I'm not speaking for them right now, but I do have a very good relationship with them and I know they love Edgewood, that if we have to go to court with the state again, I'm prepared to make that recommendation. And I'm saying that to you because I want you to understand these decisions are not easy, but sometimes you can't, you can't always be the nice guy about everything. There are people behind that. So I, I wanna share that with you because it's not easy. It's not, it's not easy, I don't hide from that. But making the difficult decisions is what a superintendent does. So I'm going to get off my soapbox, but I want you to know that's where I'm at. So let's talk about some information that we want to share with you today. Go ahead, Ms. Over. Our five guiding principles. Not going to read them to you anymore. We're going to go ahead and start some information that we want to share with you. And I'm going to come back through the presentation and share some support systems that we're bringing in for you uh, as teachers. Uh, and then I'm also going to share with you what we're going to be talking about a week from now. So you're gonna hear from our um, operations chief, Mr. Uh, Mr. Williams. You're gonna hear from Ms. Dominguez as well. And then myself when it comes to the uh, health resource or human resources pieces here. So I'm gonna turn it over at this point uh, to, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. And we're gonna talk about guiding principle two, uh, which is health and safety. So you're gonna hear from our chief of operations. We'll go to the next slide. And I will turn it over to you, Mr. Williams. Well, thank you, Dr. Hernandez. Good morning, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to share with you just a few things from our team members uh, and, when, what the, and what we've planned to ensure a safer environment for all of us. Next slide, please. Uh, let's begin with, with transportation. The recent parent survey results unveiled to us that an overwhelming majority of parents stated that they would drop off their child by car. Another major takeaway from the survey 
parents indicated that it is extremely important to them that school buses ran at half capacity. The district will continue to remain abreast of the latest recommendations from the uh, local authorities, uh, health authorities, which is the C as well as the CDC, the TEA, and to ensure the safety of our staff and students. If you would progress to the next slide, Ms. Ogle. Okay, yeah. So in saying that, uh, we want we, we will still we are receiving a very limited uh, information about recommendations about student transportation uh, from the TEA. Next slide, please. With the survey from the parents and the guidelines from TEA and the CDC regarding the six feet of social distancing, our transportation team, led by Mr. Martin Molina, used this information to amend the student bus protocols. For example, all students, drivers, and bus aides are required to wear a mask, unless in cases where the student qualifies for an exception. While remaining six feet apart, students will board the bus one at a time, filling the seats from rear to front in a staggered formation, sitting in the window seats only. Seating that is closed will be clearly marked with signage. The, the entire first row of seating directly behind the driver will be closed for student seating as well. Students will, who live in the same household may sit on the same seat together once confirmed uh, by the transportation department. The seating for, this seating formation will allow us to transport approximately 13 students on a 72 passenger bus. When exiting the bus while remaining six feet apart, students will exit the bus from front to rear. Our drivers will ensure they speak to students and help them understand these new, these new protocols. Next slide, please. At the end of each route, and keeping in step with CDC recommendations as well as TD, uh, TA recommendations, our team members will clean and disinfect all high touch areas of the bus and do uh, routine maintenance on the bus, continue to do routine maintenance on the bus, buses as well. Next slide, please. Now let's talk about child nutrition. Like, like transportation, our child nutrition team, led by Ms. Roxanne Ruiz, has made a few changes to how we serve students. During the weeks of district-wide remote-only instruction, again, during the weeks, those four weeks Dr. Nandy spoke about, during the transition weeks of district-wide remote-only instruction, all campuses, with the exception of Memorial High School, will serve curbside grab-and-go meals from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Memorial students may go to any district site for meals. The meal package will consist of a breakfast and a lunch meal. Once the, the district transitions uh, to remote and on-campus instruction, as well as hybrid, uh, meals for students utilizing the remote instruction model will be curbside grab and go at the Emma Fry cafeteria only, and that is from 10 to 1 as well. On-campus on students, will be served a breakfast grab and go meal that may be consumed in the classroom. On campus lunches will be served in the cafeteria, meaning it will be picked up in the cafeteria and it may be consumed either in the cafeteria or the, or the classroom. For example, students will enter the cafeteria lined up six feet apart. They will enter the service line, select their meal, stop at the cashier station and proceed, and proceed to their seat in the cafeteria where students will sit six feet apart. We will mark the seating to better assist our students. Students dining in the classroom will return to their classroom and consume their meals at their desk in a space that is already socially distanced. All meals will be wrapped individually as seen in the, as seen in the photo uh, on the screen. Next, please. Okay, finally, our custodial team, led by Mr. Ernest Cantu, has amended, have, have amended their uh, protocols as well. The, the team disinfects the district's facilities daily now to ensure that we are as safe as possible. I say again, we're doing this daily now. Additionally, there are times throughout the day uh, that they clean and disinfect uh, high-touch areas. Although it is time-consuming, 
we feel it is well worth it as we exercise in an, abo an abundance of caution. We are committed to doing what we can to serve and support in this trying time. You will continue to hear more from me in the near future on other town halls about the other areas of operations uh, to include athletics uh, and maintenance and construction. Thank you, Ms. Olga. Thank you, sir. Real quick, I've been getting tons of text messages and emails. We have reached our capacity today for the um, licensing agreement with Region 20. So first, I want to say thank you all. Um, that means a lot of people are joining in. I will say we will increase our licensing capacity for next time. And this presentation and video will be sent out today. So anybody who has not, um, who was not able to log in today because of the capacity, we will send it out today. So if you can just, um, I know I've been emailing whoever has been responding to me and messaging, um, but if you can just let your friends and your faculty know and your staff and your coworkers that we will be sending it out via internet um, email today. So I'm going to hand it back over to Dr. Hernandez. Okay, so here I go on back. I hope everybody can hear me. So we're gonna go ahead, if you'll change the slide and go into guiding principle three which addresses con the continuity, mental health, and well-being of all. And so um, let's go ahead and go on. So the last time we were at, a, at our town hall meeting, um, I started by analyzing the graphic you see there on your right. You'll recall this graphic from the teacher survey that um, you submitted that I believe came out of Ms. Dominguez's office, where it asked you pretty, pretty directly, if all safety measures are in place, do you, feel the sa do you feel safe and confident about the return to school? So obviously there's a lot of concern right around the middle, close to 50% of folks. Because of that graphic, I decided to use the graphic on the left when I said, would you email me and tell me your thoughts? Because a lot of you were already talking to me, asking me about coming to uh, your campus to, to work remotely, that those were your wishes, because it was very difficult for you to work from home. And in fact, some of you are already out there because I've seen the pictures, but hey, I get it. And so I want to formalize that because I think we have to be intentional with everything that we do, which is why I asked you uh, for your written feedback. And let me tell you, I thank many of you. I heard from almost every campus. Um, some campuses I heard from more than others. I, at this point now, going into my third year, I know who my campuses are that speak in a unison, some who speak a lot, and then some who are much more quieter. Uh, and I try to go to the campuses that are quieter. I try to make myself personally available. Uh, but I, I do appreciate all the feedback. The feedback, the good, the indifferent, what, the upset, I get it. I, don't, I want you to know, I, if you haven't figured it out by now, I don't take things personal. I get that as the superintendent, there, that this, this, this role comes with the fact that sometimes there will be displaced anger with you. I get it. And I, I pray for myself so that I can be, make better decisions. I ask you for that. And I also use facts at the end of the day. And so I want to share with you three levels of responses that I received. So I took all those emails and I grouped them into three types of teacher responses. Now everybody, if you, I wanna remind you, when I say teacher, I use that loosely because to me, teacher can be support staff, it can be counselors, I've heard from counselors, social workers, um, paras, folks in the, in the schools. And so that's a very loosely used term, but I took all those responses and put them into three types of individuals. So let's go to the next slide. So here's what I heard. I heard from the teachers that said, hey, Doc, I voluntarily request to come to work in my classroom. In fact, I've been talking to my principal. In fact, here's some pictures of what I'm doing already. So, I mean, okay, I get it. So here's what we wanna do intentionally so that we make sure that we are having, we have a process in terms of doing, in terms of allowing you to work in your classroom. So we're gonna go to the next um, slide. You will be getting an email today from our Chief of Human Resources and Student Services, Ms. Trevino, that will be asking you to follow a procedure, which is basically emailing your principal formally and asking that you be allowed to come to your campus and work remotely in your classroom. Whether that be setting up or doing whatever you're doing, many of you have expressed that you're in a place where you can come and that you choose to come during the next week, during the transition and whatever we do forward. Now I am right now specific, if you can see that memo, you're gonna see it later, but on the where it says subject, I'm specifically talking about August 3rd through the 7th right now in terms of that email that I'm asking you to send your principal. Next week, we'll go a little deeper with this. But if the way I look at it, 
is if you're volunteering now and you're saying, I want to come, you said to me in your emails, I'm going to, I want to volunteer because it's just easy for me to teach remotely. And I actually, I will follow all the guidelines because we, you will, will be asking you to come in, use the QR code to check in, make sure that you're, you're taking your temperature, you, you're masked constantly, you're socially distant, you stay, you, you're in your room, you stay away from as many people, from people as, as possible. So we're following all those guidelines. And in the middle of doing that, we're also going to ask you if you feel up to it, please share your thoughts with us in terms of your principal and say, hey, I noticed this works really well. I noticed this. Uh, maybe I'm a kindergarten teacher and I have a reality that I deal with every day that maybe you need to know about. Or I'm a seventh grade teacher and I'm in that back hallway and in that back hallway that I'm in the classroom, in the same classroom, I typically see this. So those are all things that we collectively need to work with so that we can continue to enhance our plan. And so again, you're going to be getting a formalized email uh, from Ms. Trevino by the end, by tomorrow, uh, with regards to this request. So I'm going to take us to the next category of people. These are the individuals that have said, and there's a group of you here, big one, teachers that voluntarily request to work from their classroom, but doc, I need support. I have little ones. I, I don't know what to do. I want to come. My husband and I are both teachers and we both want to come, but what about our kids? I mean, I, 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 there's the, there is the moral side of me that says I need to be there for our students and I need to be there in my classroom, but I also have children. And so I'm going to take us to the next slide. We will have more information for, uh, on this next week, but I do want you to know that right now we are looking at something that we are calling like an employee support service that would allow us to have some level of support in the schools that will allow you to bring your children if you directly, and I'm going to say this a couple of times, if you are a member who directly supports instruction in the classroom, I'll say that again, because next week we'll have it in writing. If you directly support instruction in the classroom, this opportunity will be there for you. We're going to talk to, we're going to continue, to, we're going to talk to principals tomorrow. I am a little more in depth about this because this is something that we're working on standing up. There's a lot of background we have to fill in and make sure that I'm working with a lot of other superintendents on this to be, to, to be fully transparent. Um, and so, but I feel like this is something that our staff needs because there were so many of you that emailed me in that group and said, I want to come, but I need help. I hear, I hear you. And I appreciate you having the courage to say that you wanted to come. I appreciate that. We'll go to the next slide. Then there's the group who says, doc, I have a situation. I wish I could come, but I just can't come right now. There's, there's, a, there's a lot going on in, in, in the family, and I just, I just can't. So I say to you, thank you also for being courageous and saying that to me. I get it. And I can't tell you that I'm going to, I have a solution that I'm going to pull a rabbit out of my hat and all of it's going to go away. I can't. What I can tell you right now is that for now, and I'm going to keep talking about this, during our transition period, that will be an option for you. If you want to work from home, that will, I'm going to, I'm going to work with you on that. I will have more details on that, but I hear what you're saying. But what I'd like to, what I hope you're seeing through this conversation is that we really need to look at phasing in our approach to working with our response to COVID-19. Because the reality is that at some point we're going to, we're going to come back to school. Now, when that happens, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't even know that I'm going to be here tomorrow. I mean, that's, you know, we use that expression in my family. Um, but I do know that I'm going to continue to base my decisions based on facts and making sure that students have access to high quality instruction. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that on, on how we're doing beyond just the academics. So again, we have three, so these are the three groups that I just discussed with regards to their ability to working in the classroom and can do it now. I wanna work in the classroom, but I need some help. And I wish I could, I can't, I have a situation. And let's be honest, I'm, I mean, cause I said I was gonna be transparent. Not everybody's been polite on the email. And I get it. I'm, I'm not, I'm not upset at you. You know, I get it. And, if, and, and, and if, if you feel that I'm causing stress to you, I, that is not my intention. I get to represent the 14,000 people. I'm sorry, not 14,000, a little over 12,000 people, which encompasses kids and adults. So I'm going to make the best decision that I can and I will move on. That's just simply the way it is. And so I have gone, I'm going, I'm going through the links of explaining my rationale, my thinking, because I think you deserve it and because I respect you. Those words are not lost on me. I do it because I respect you. And so 
You'll hear me talk about this more next week. But right now, this is where we are. This is the work that we're, that we're lifting up to support you. And so um, I'm trying to look at the chat while I'm talking. Um, and I see that people are asking questions and we're gonna address those. So I'm gonna keep us moving on to the next. And this brings us to guiding principle four, which is high quality instruction. And I'll come back after Ms. Dominguez. So I will turn it over to Angela. Good morning, Edgewood ISD. Um, thank you, Dr. Hernandez, for clarifying some things that I know a lot of people have questions around. Um, really excited to share some information with you guys today. We're trying our very best to get things to you in a timely manner. We know that you're concerned and that you want to begin preparing for your students. And so hopefully today we'll clarify a couple of things around the instruction side. Olga, if you go ahead and advance the slide for me. So with remote learning, we have two primary goals that I want to talk to you about today. The first is that we've really got to increase learner engagement in remote learning by providing high quality instruction online. So in the spring when we left, um, that was unexpected. So we were in crisis mode, which means that we responded as quickly as we could with the knowledge we had then. Now we, we know what we're walking into. And so we've got to be a little bit more mindful about how we push out high quality instruction to our kids. What's the best way to reach them? And then how do we keep our kids actively engaged so that we don't create further gaps? I'm also going to talk to you a little bit today about emphasis on building the four C's. We want to talk about confidence, collaboration, courage, and clarity for our staff. Go ahead, Olga. So some important data um, from the spring, you guys completed our student learner profiles. And I really want to thank you. I know that that was a heavy lift for our secondary teachers who had a lot of students, but it was really valuable data and we are using it to the max right now. So we're working with an outside group called TNTP and they are doing in-depth data analysis on our students to help us really identify how we support them as we continue this process of remote learning um, throughout the course of this school year. So some important data from that particular piece was that 27% of our students were highly engaged during the, the COVID school closure in the spring. 70% of our kids approximately were engaged in some way, shape or form. So that's, that's good news. The bad news is, is that we also have some students that we were unable to make contact with, or even if we made contact, we were unable to get academic work from those students. So when I say we need to increase student engagement in high quality learning, this is where that data is coming from. So we'll have a real heavy focus on improving the number of kids that we're reaching and that we're getting high quality work back from this fall. Go ahead. Over. So what is remote learning? I, I think it's important to keep in perspective the, the differences and the challenges for both our staff and our kids with remote learning. In the classroom, we have a lot more structure and things that we can do to provide a good learning environment for our kids. That may not be the same for our learners at home. The other thing that we know about at home or remote learning is that kids need to have um, the ability to drive their own learning. And so the interesting thing, not surprising at all from the student learner profiles is kids that were highly motivated before school closure were still pretty highly motivated to, to engage in work. Um, when they were working from home. The other thing that we learned, I think, from our spring experience is that certain programs and platforms promoted higher engagement than others. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. This slide, it will be in the slide deck that Olga sends out today. So I'm not gonna read through all of this in detail, but I think it's important for us to keep in perspective as we're planning and preparing for remote learning. Okay, Olga. So what are the roles and the responsibilities? I, I will share with you that um, for those of you, I'm sure that have small children, it was really hard on families. I had three children in college and it was still hard on the family to establish routines, expectations. So our parents are really concerned when it comes to their role in educating the kids when they're on remote learning. The reality is, guys, that we're starting remote with all students, but we'll have approximately half of our students, according to parent feedback, that will continue learning in this platform. So please read through the role of the educator and the role of the family. I think most important for you to note is that we need to provide the structure 
we need to provide the in instruction and we need to provide the intervention and support to keep students on grade level. So we're gonna talk collectively about how we do that as a team because it's not easy work to do when we don't have our classroom space and control of the environment that our children are working in. So I wanna engage in a conversation around the four core competencies that we're gonna be working on. Um, the first is gonna be competence to do this work because this is different work. We're really changing the landscape of how we educate our students. We're gonna to have to be very collaborative, guys. If you haven't noticed that this, this is going to push us to be more collaborative than ever, I, I think that um, we all support Dr. Hernandez in giving teachers some options right now. We're listening and we're trying to be open about how we support you. But if we're not collaborative, we won't be able to execute the work and engage all of our students in high quality education. So this is gonna be an essential portion to the conversation that we have today. The other area is courage. It's going to take a lot of courage to change your thinking about how we educate students and to, to grow together. So we're learning as quickly as our students are learning. Um, the technology platforms, teaching in them is, is something new for some of us. Some of us are more proficient than others, but this is a category where we really need to, to be open to know that we're gonna have to grow together. And the last is clarity. As we continue to get new guidelines, new updates, it's important for us to keep communicating with you. And then as we bring back on our students and parents that you are communicating with students and parents on a routine basis. And when there's not clear understanding that we're circling back and asking those questions that help us to all be on the same page. So when we talk about confidence, I wanna talk a little bit about um, training, development, and managing the, the work, the scope of work that's going to be involved in this process of creating remote learning experiences. In the spring, we created some teacher tiers for professional development. You guys weighed in on where you thought you kind of fit into that in terms of your skill or proficiency level with the platforms, the programs, and some of the um, technology-based pieces that we've been working with. This allowed us to differentiate the teacher professional development in the spring and help you to grow at your own pace. We know that everybody's at different areas and it's important for us to be mindful of the assets that, that we as a collective team bring back. So you're still going to see us working around differentiated support for teaching and learning so that teachers get what they need and continue to grow in incremental ways. The next piece you're gonna see is professional development. If you'll go back, Olga, I'm sorry. There'll be a link when Olga sends this out to you. I'm not gonna have her pull it up right now, but this is actually on our webpage. Um, we have already published PD by grade level or by grade band. So wanna have you start taking a look at that. This is something that you can do to start pre-preparing yourself. There are certain baseline expectations for each grade level that are going to be essential to us rolling out high quality learning for our students when they return. The other thing we're gonna address is time. I think the biggest um, challenge for us in creating virtual learning opportunities for our students is do we have the time to really do this in a way that we can roll out something that is high quality engage our scholars. We're going to talk a little bit, bit about the daily schedule and hopefully um, we can alleviate some of your concern about having enough time to be able to do this work when we're working with our students in a remote setting. And then the last thing is a manageable load. And as we're doing the work, I, I will share with you that all of us on this end are also diving into the programs, Seesaw, Teams, setting up classrooms. We want to be able to understand the lift. We've been working closely with teachers and instructional coaches over the last three weeks to have them try out the process of creating those videos, creating the activities. And so it's helped us to gauge how much a teacher might be able to manage and what makes sense in terms of how we collaborate and set up the workload. Okay, Olga. So what does the schedule look like? Um, this is a sample and uh, principals will be sharing with you a little bit more in detail the, the schedules at your various levels. But I want you to see what you can expect when you see the student side of the schedule. Parents are asking for daily routines and structure. They wanna know when are we meeting synchronously and when does my child need to be doing what particular activities. 
what this means for us is that there will be synchronous meet times. We did not necessarily enforce that in the spring, that this will be a required component of our virtual learning expectations moving forward. So during synchronous times, parents, students, and teachers are expected to be logged into Teams and meeting to connect. Our kids asked for this, guys, and I think that what we found from our students is that the ones that didn't get that direct connection were the ones that were least engaged. So in order to increase that engagement, we have to be tight around communicating with kids on a daily basis. So you will see on all schedules, both at the elementary, early childhood, middle school and high school, that there is a morning teams meeting and there is an end of day teams meeting. This is going to be critical in terms of connection. This is also where we will engage in the work around social emotional learning. We know that our kids are going to have some challenges. This has been a trying time on families overall. Then you'll see time during the day where there's asynchronous learning. Those are things that students can do at their own pace, but with some parameters. So we are expecting students to engage daily. Next week when we meet, we'll talk a little bit more about attendance reporting and how that looks on the teacher end. Okay, Olga? So here's where I want to help to maybe alleviate some of your concern. The student schedule, that facing side, talks about what the, the students should be engaging in throughout the course of the day. The teacher facing side is, is really a little bit different and what we've tried to do is build in some things to the schedule to make it manageable for us to all engage in the work of supporting remote learners. So what you'll see in the teacher side is there's time for you to have your synchronous meetups with your students with your homeroom or your um, advisory which will be called wins at the secondary level what i need to succeed um, then you'll see time for you to engage in individual small group or tutoring work where you're calling kids to the table to do some synchronous meets so this might look like in the elementary schedule from 9 to 1030 our K3 teachers will be doing individualized and small group literacy instruction on teams. So I may say, you know, today I'm going to pull Ed, Olga and Elvis and you're going to be with me on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays at nine o'clock. I need you logged on so that we could work together. There are some skill sets that cannot be taught asynchronously and we're, we're well aware of our early learners and the need to be in a virtual setting, but also be connecting with them daily and have opportunities for direct teach. What you'll see on the schedule in yellow is planning and development time. And so I think this is something that will be really important for us as staff is to have time to both develop these high quality video lessons to continue our professional learning and growth and development so that we keep getting better at this process. And then also to evaluate the progress of students in the various programs and platforms that we're using. Providing student feedback online is a little bit different. And so we wanna make sure that we're building that into the schedule and providing structures for us to get this done. You'll also see in all schedules, district curriculum planning time. So when I say we've gotta do this lift together, you're going to see that we are actually going to be an Edgewood ISD planning team it is no longer about my school, it's about my district and making sure that we are working collectively together to accomplish the goals that we have for our students. Olga? So, so collaboration to making this happen. Um, collaboration will happen in small group. It will also happen on teams. So teachers, when you're expecting to collaborate with your team, if you opt for working remotely from home or working in your classroom, We'll probably be connecting through teams the majority of the time as we're creating our planning process. So teachers are going to be assigned to content pods that support the, high, the rollout of high quality virtual lessons. So I'm going to go a little bit more into detail, Olga, if you'll go to the next slide. So what does that look like? And what do I mean when I talk about how we're rolling out instruction? A lot of work has gone into this, um, the curriculum and instruction team, all of academic services has been working um, relentlessly this summer and actually since the spring to revise and edit the way we think about um, how we roll out learning for students. So you're going to see revised and updated unit resource guides for our core content areas. These will be available to our bilingual teachers with key pieces of that in Spanish. 
but they look different. And so the, the rollout of our URGs is really going to support developing high quality asynchronous lessons. I say this guys, because I want you to understand that even when students do begin coming back on campus, our platform for learning in Edgewood ISD this year will be asynchronous with the support of synchronous teaching from the teacher, whether that be on Teams or in the classroom. So all tier one lessons will actually be prepared in this manner and rolled out to students through the video process. So that's a lot of work. Um, we've actually, like I said, had people coming in and beginning that work. What you'll find in this document that you get today are some links to show you what it looks like. So we've mocked up a couple of models so that you can start seeing what instruction will look like from the lens of the teacher and from the lens of the student. We know that this is going to take a lot of time. So as we've done this, we're digging in. It takes time to prep high quality lessons. The other thing that we realize is that teachers are going to have to specialize. So it's really difficult to think about doing all contents and being successful in that. So what we've asked the campus principals to do at this time is to really work with us and the curriculum team to determine which teachers will be teaching what. So when you come back, what you'll find is that if you are an elementary teacher, you will be assigned to either teach math or thematic literacy in grades K to three. In four and five, it'll be math, science, or um, ELAR. And so we'll talk a little bit about secondary when I get to the next slide, but we're really going to have to specialize guys to, to make this lift possible for all teachers. This is gonna make your work a little bit more streamlined and help you to better support your students. What that means is students are going to get an interface similar to the one that you'll link on below, which is um, the asynchronous lesson. A task card is laid out. In elementary at K3, we have integrated science and social studies into the literacy block. So this will be a transition, but this was the way that we could get the most bang for our buck in terms of helping our students to stay on grade level and recover what may have been lost in the spring. So the student will see integrated lessons that are all together. Our kids are actually going to see video lessons from teachers across the district. That means that we'll be having access to other people's prepared lessons or other pods prepared lessons so that we can roll those out to our students in our homeroom class. That's a lot to digest. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it there and we're gonna keep coming back to that in the subsequent town hall meetings. Olga, if you'll go to the next slide. So for secondary, um, we will be operating in the Teams platform in terms of asynchronous instructional delivery. Again, you see a student learning task card. I, I want to thank um, our team at Brentwood, our team in curriculum. We have really been trying to, to hammer out how we make this manageable for students so that they have clarity on what they should be doing on a daily basis. And so you'll see that the interface makes it very simple for students to have a checklist of this is what I've got to get done on Monday for this content. We want to be very clear with students and families about what they need to do to be successful academically with our work. You'll see a sample um, again. So the secondary teachers, I encourage you to go into this when we um, leave today or when you get a copy of this about team teaching and working together as a collective content pod. So we're going to work across district lines and really support one another. The other thing I would encourage our secondary teachers to do if you haven't already is familiarize yourself with class notebook. So in the teams feature. This is where we will be housing our curriculum and the, the lessons that will roll out to students. So if you haven't had a chance to dive into that. That's a good first step to getting yourself ready for fall instruction. We'll also be working just like elementary to limit teacher preps. And so we're working with campus principals at this time to identify who will be teaching what, but where teachers have multiple preps and we can eliminate that, we'll actually be minimizing the number of preps that teachers will have on a daily basis. Our optimal is that teachers will prepare for only one content. And so that's the optimal. It's not as realistic at the high school level because there are some singleton courses that may require teachers to have a lift of more preps than that. So do know that more information is coming. This just gives you a really good sample of what things might look like as we're returning in the fall. Go ahead, Olga. So when we say it's going to take courage to do this work, I think that 
there are three things that are really important here that I want you to be mindful of. The first is, is that we're going to have to connect a lot more than we have in our prior practice. We're going to connect with teachers that are teaching Algebra 1 across the district instead of just sitting with my team at Gus Garcia or at Brentwood or at Wren. This is really going to be about us coming together as a family in Edgewood to give our kids the very best. The next thing is we're going to have to learn. All of us are at different levels when it comes to the implementation of virtual learning and asynchronous learning for our students when it comes to various platforms. And so this is really about being open and knowing that we're going to be vulnerable in this. We're, we're going to be learning and we might muddle things. And so this is, this is a process for all of us. The last is trust. You're going to have to trust in the quality of what teachers are preparing across the district. So we're going to have to start relying on one another if we plan to do this work in a way that doesn't burn anybody out, but really helps us to collectively become really great for our kids. So the last of the competencies was clarity. And this is, this is something that Dr. H has gone over this morning many, many times. And um, we're going to keep coming back with this. We're defining, redefining, and then we're refining what we do here. So we want teacher feedback. We, we want to hear what works, what doesn't work. We are bringing in teachers to try things out before you even come back. And so do know that this is a process. And just like we said, you guys are going to have to learn and be open. We're learning, we're growing, and we're going to be rolling things out to you in a way that makes sense. And that also we keep refining when it doesn't make sense. And so the practicality of being in the field is very different. And we, we know that. So we're working closely with teachers to make sure that this is a manageable lift and that we give you the time that's needed to, to make it happen for our kids. So I want to thank you. Um, next steps, teachers right now, um, you do not have to go out and start prepping videos for every lesson of the week. That's work we will be doing together when you return. What you do need to, to make sure happens right now is that you have brushed up on Seesaw and Teams and that you're ready to roll in terms of your technology skill to support the content pod that you're assigned to. I'm going to hand it back to Dr. H and follow up with any questions that are in the chat. So first of all, I want to thank Angela for being very clear uh, with our next steps uh, as we transition. Um, she said a lot, but I think the thing that, that resonates with me is the feedback loop. When we ask you for feedback, that is, a, that is not a lost cause. We, we believe in feedback. Um, you know, we've, we as a team have gone through that process. I mean, we're, we're human too. Everybody, that's something we, we work to develop. But if we wanting to become a great district means that we should honor and value feedback, uh, all kinds of feedback. And so you've always heard me talk about it. I'm glad that the members of my team are also speaking to it because we do spend time talking about it. And so I thank Angela for that because as the leader of the academics department, um, she is the she leads us, and she in her mentality will have a huge influence on what we do. So thank you, Angela. So I'm going to keep us moving into our last guiding principle. Uh, our fifth guiding principle is around educational equity. So a lot of you have had many personal conversations with me about social justice, uh, not only in the history of our district, but also in the everyday things. When some of you uh, help someone fill out, if you're in high school, an application for FAFSA or, or the Common App or whatever you're using nowadays to get kids into college, or maybe it's just taking kids when we could take kids to a college. Or if you're in middle school is advising somebody on what courses do you take in sixth grade and maybe sometimes pushing someone into an advanced course or in the elementary schools is really helping our parents learn how to navigate and broker the educational system as they begin to use it. And so educational equity takes many forms. And so the last time we met, go ahead and change the slide, Ms. Ola. We talked about the district's efforts in regards to supporting um, um, social justice. And so you heard me talk about our district. I made a decision that our district would be paying for our students' uh, supplies this year. You know, I took, I'm taking into consideration the fact that we have many parents who have lost their jobs and who are struggling to make ends meet. And so that tells me, first and foremost, to remain uh, uh, happy, not happy, but gracious, that I have a job uh, and I have added a gratitude about that. I'm happy. And that also that we are able to have our jobs and that our board uh, supports us in that. And so that's the first thing. 
And then also, this is one less thing that parents need to worry, worry about. We want the kids, we want access so that we can support our kids in the best way possible. And while these are the things that I can do as a superintendent in terms of paying for these things, we need you to become the best high quality remote teacher that you can be. Because it isn't just about, well, I want to be a remote teacher. Are we ready to be remote teachers away from the classroom? And some of you have been, I'm going to tell you, a lot of you have been very honest with me to say, I don't feel ready for that, which is why I'm going to be in my classroom. I will tell you, we watched in the spring, I, I, I watched, we weren't all delivering quality instruction. I'm going to say that. I'll say that. We weren't. And so for whatever reason, did we attempt to? Absolutely, everybody did. But we still have to address the fact that we have learning deficiencies, just like kids do. That's not anything to be ashamed of. What I'm saying is that something that we have to address and get better at. And many of the grand majority of you have a very positive attitude, uh, and I appreciate that. And I know there are some who have a deficit thinking model and the mindset's not quite there. And so we're gonna move on beyond that because we have an obligation to educate kids. So again, these are the school supplies that uh, our academic services team has stood up and we're gonna use these to bring supplies to our schools and have those things ready. We can go to the next slide. And so these are just samples. You saw the pre-K five, now middle and high school. If you, we can keep moving on because you're gonna get the PowerPoint anyways. And as I said before, we're gonna be asking parents to purchase these few things for us if and when they can. If a parent says, I just can't do it, well, then they just can't do it. But whatever they can throughout the year, we're going to accept. And in fact, we've had parents already ask, drop things off at the police station if it's after hours, and they do leave it like, this is for such and such school. And so no parents are trying to help us. So just like Angela said, this is going to take courage. It's going to take a collective effort so that we're all helping in every way possible that we can. Let's keep going. To that end, many of you asked me questions last time about student dress code and a teacher dress code. I'm going to get there in a little bit. But with regards to student dress code, I am going to give, I am going to be giving parents the option to use uniforms if they'd like, because I don't want to just say, no, you don't have to wear uniforms. And then a parent was counting on the uniform. So I'm going to give options. If you want to wear the uniform, by all means, when our students come back there, you're free to do that. But then they can also wear any of the items you see here that are in accordance with the CCMR and College of Career Military Readiness, whether it's a school shirt, or if you can't get a spirit shirt, maybe your school colors are green and yellow, wear a yellow t-shirt, a green t-shirt, um, whatever, whatever, how, however creative you can get. Maybe it's on your mask. Um, you saw the mask that I'm wearing. It could be a college shirt. It could be, uh, you can wear jeans. The kids can wear jeans if they'd like to uh, as well, because I know right now wash, um, wash doing laundry is gonna be probably something people are gonna be doing frequently. And so I know jeans have much more uh, wear and tear ability, uh, having washed many jeans many years for my daughter. I remember that. And so um, it's important that we also take those things into consideration for our parents. So that is going to be something that we're addressing in the student handbook um, and that uh, we will be allowing our students to, um, to do for next year. And then when it comes to you, same thing. You are more than welcome to wear jeans uh, every day of the school year uh, upon our return. You can wear a college t-shirt, you can wear a military shirt, uh, technical school, the colors of your shirt, um, those, um, those things that are in accordance with college and career readiness. So um, there, you, there you go. So we're gonna go on to the next slide. Oh, but let me be specific. Thank you, I appreciate that. I, I do have my folks that are helping me here. Some of you asked me specifically about scrubs. We are not gonna be wearing scrubs next year. So I wanna be very specific about that. It is jeans that we will be wearing. So I'm gonna say it again. Scrubs are not something that we're gonna be wearing. We will be wearing jeans uh, for next year and these options that we have here. So thank you, thank you for reminding me. Let's go ahead and go to the next thing. So the last time we met also as part of being equitable and, 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 and addressing matters of social justice, I also told you that our board made a huge investment in our one-to-one -one, um, technology uh, district. So we now have, uh, we will be providing a digital device for all kids as they return to school. But we're, we're even gonna take it one step for, forward and we're working on this right now, but I'm gonna share this with you. Let's go to the next slide. I wanna thank our Chief Technology and Innovation Officer, uh, Christopher Nestor uh, and his team. And of course, all the members of the senior leadership team because they also provide guidance for him. We are looking at standing up a mesh network in our district so that we are able to push out uh, accessibility to the internet um, in our school district. You heard me say last time, connectivity to 
the, the internet is the next civil rights issue. I believe that because for those folks who are blocked out or can't have access, then they're losing out on an inability to um, educate themselves. I mean, this is the information age at the end of the day. There are many teachers in our district who just came out of college or, or maybe you're in a master's program, you're using that same technology to educate yourself. And so if we don't, we don't fight for, you know, for justice, if we don't use our investment, our money, if we don't advocate through politicians, if we don't also use folks like, for example, Ms. McCullis, who works with the individuals at Port SA or the different individuals at the city of San Antonio, so that we can have partnerships to say, how do you bring your resources, our resources, and in between us and downtown is San Antonio ISD. And I, you know, he's not here, but I thank my counterpart in SAISD, Mr. Martinez, because we've developed a great friendship. And we talk about social issues of social justice. And so how do we use our combined resources to create a mesh network to help more of our students? And so know that this is happening, it is in the works. I just saw uh, Felipe and Adan yesterday from the technology department when I went to the board meeting on Tuesday out in front of the DCC building testing uh, how far the accessibility is. And so I thank individuals like them who are out there in the heat um, trying to work towards connectivity for our kids and for you. And so no, this is, again, this is being worked uh, on. We will update you. I, again, I remain committed to being transparent. Um, and so we're gonna keep sharing this with you. So there, I'll leave it that, I'll leave it at that. Go ahead, man. And so as we close, we're about to close here. I wanna talk to you about a few things that we're gonna address uh, next time at our next virtual town hall, same time, same bat channel, August 6th, a week from now. A few things that we're gonna address because I saw some of these questions in the Q&A. So let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> You know me, I'm all about pictures. So next, next time we meet, I'm going to talk to you about the second four weeks that I'm going to be asking the board to approve so that we can move forward with an, another four weeks between September 14th and October 9th. Now the board, the board will have to approve that resolution and we will have to stand up a rationale that has to be supported by metrics that would support our request for a waiver from TEA. So I am actually going to be calling a meeting with the board for next week. And this is one of the items that I'm going to be bringing to them, as well as continuing to educate them on our response to COVID-19, following the five guiding principles that you heard about today. And so again, being transparent and letting you know that those meetings are happening. The second thing also is the next time I want to talk to you about August 14th and the teacher workday. And so there'll be more information that I'm going to be sharing with you. But I actually got this picture hot off the presses from one of our teachers in elementary who's going from kindergarten next year to high school. I admire that. I admire people who can do that because uh, there was once upon a time, your superintendent went from kindergarten to ninth grade algebra one. And so if you ever have a whole two minutes, I can tell you about that jump. Um, and so um, I, I, I commend folks that are already prepared to do remote instruction. I commend all three categories of people because everybody's reality is different, but nonetheless, everybody's reality is something that I see and I respect. And so thank you. We're going to talk about August 14th teacher workday. You're also going to hear next week from uh, our chief of HR, Cindy Trevino. You won't have to look at me anymore. She looks much better than I do on, t on, on here. And so she's going to talk to you about what options we have in terms of uh, it's FFCRA, I think if I got that correctly, that's basically the law under COVID-19 and what options are available because some of you are, 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 are on the Q&A saying, asking questions that are very, very specific to you. And so those are gonna require for us to educate you on your legal options. And I don't shy away from conversations like that, guys. I get it. And again, I don't take things personal. And so I understand that there are realities that we won't be able to mitigate and help you with, but that there is some legal uh, uh, outlets, if you will, that you'll be able to employ if you choose to do so. And so you'll exercise those through HR, but I wanna to begin to um, educate you because education is the key to everything on what resources you have. So that is going to be for next week. So we'll go ahead and move on to the next slide. Today's idea was to talk about the restart plan. Those are the five guiding principles you see here. I think we have adequately uh, discussed these and brought new information to you. Just like a lesson, we started with what we know, talked about the context of today's discussion. We talked about the five guiding principles and gave you a little bit, bit of a snippet information in these areas. And then I also, I also gave you, your exit ticket was to know what's gonna happen next week. So Angela, I hope that I met all the requirements of a, of a quality lesson. You know, I, I don't forget being a teacher. And so I try to do my, my uh, presentations this way. 
But as always, guys, if we can go to the last slide, it continues to be an honor to serve you and support you. Um, I love what I do. I hope you can see that. I some days walk out feeling like I made a difference. And I'm going to keep doing that and fighting the good fight for us, making decisions that I hope support you, disagreeing at times. That happens in leadership. I don't expect to agree with everyone, um, but I do expect to do it with the utmost integrity and with a servant's heart. So everybody, it is 12:13. I went over a little bit, but I wish you a good day. God bless each of you. And I'm going to turn it over to, back to our host. I appreciate her leading these uh, conversations and helping me. So Ms. McCullough, it's back to you. Thank you, everybody, again. And I want to say um, thank you to Region 20. We will be asking for them to up the attendance um, attendance, so we can have more people online. But again, I will be sending the video out once we get it um, uploaded and edited because we have to cut off the music. Um, I'm going to leave this up for a couple more minutes. So if you have any questions, please respond. I'm going to give you about two to three minutes um, so then I can run over to the stadium and help with our food distribution this evening or this afternoon. So I'm gonna play um, a song that George Garnica asked us to play today. So again, a couple more minutes, we'll be sending out the video, we'll be sending out the Q and A's from last time because we did have quite a few and um, whatever has been answered for today. So thank you all, you all have a great day. And again, next week, same day, Thursday at 11 o'clock. <laughs>